org. Um, the slide that you're seeing right now has um, a more detailed uh, website that you you can link to. You will be able to link to and get the presentation. All participants will receive a certificate of attendance and a link to the recording following the session by email. AICP members participating in the webinar can earn 1.5 CM credits for this event. Over the next few weeks, the commission will be working to bring other sessions that were planned for the local government conference. So check back on our website to see when those are planned. Our speakers today are Steve LaFavre, Senior Managing Hydrologist and Bar with Barton and LaJudas, and John Lange, Attorney with Costello, Cooney, and Firon. Thanks to both Steve and John for agreeing to do, to do this session for us today. I hope you find this presentation informative, and again, thank you for, particip for your participation. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, John, to get the webinar started. Thank you, Jean. Um, again, this is John Condino uh, from BNL, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. And on behalf of the Tuck Hill Commission uh, and my colleagues, Steve Lefevre and John Lange, we'd like to welcome you again to today's webinar. Uh, but before turning this back over to my colleagues, I've got a few housekeeping issues that uh, we need to review. Uh, so all the, all the attendees understand you are all muted uh, with no view uh, video. Um, uh, we've scheduled a, about an hour and a half for the entire session. Uh, the presentation we figure should take about an hour, leaving us about 30 minutes for questions. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box and that chat box is actually available at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little, right in the middle of the screen, a little thing that says chat. If you write the question there, uh, what we will do is we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. We'll try to address as many questions as we can uh, we've got uh, almost 500 folks that have signed up uh, for this, uh, this important webinar. Uh, so it's more than likely going to be the case that we won't be able to address all the questions. If not, if that's the case, we'll do our best to address them uh, in a follow-up email. Um, as Jean mentioned, this session is being recorded. Uh, a link to the recording will be available on Tug Hill's website, and we will also be doing a follow-up email to um, all folks that uh, registered uh, to, again, answer any unanswered questions from today uh, and also provide another link to the video. Thanks again for joining us. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Steve and John for the presentation. Thanks, John. And uh, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your day to participate in this webinar. My name is Steve Lefevre and I'm a senior managing hydrogeologist with the engineering firm of Barton Lajudis. And I'll be co-presenting this afternoon with Mr. John Lange of the law firm of Costello, Cooney, and Farron. And John and I will be speaking to you regarding the important environmental zoning and legal aspects to take into consideration when evaluating the setting of a large utility scale solar project in your municipality. Now, um, Barton and LeJudis, one of the services that we provide is we assist planning boards in the review of, of large complex projects. And in the past 12 to 18 months, many of our municipal clients have been approached by solar developers wishing to uh, construct solar facilities in their municipalities. And many of these solar developers are targeting uh, municipalities that have open tracts of available land. So a lot of agricultural land, open, open fields. And we're finding out that a lot of these municipal planning boards, um, they aren't really used to dealing with projects such as this. So we've been providing a lot of assistance to these planning boards and, and really helping them to uh, figure out what aspects would they want to pay attention to when they're evaluating um, a project such as this. For those of you who aren't familiar with Barton and Judas, we're a multi-discipline multi engineering firm. We were founded in 1961. We're located, we're headquartered in Syracuse, New York with offices throughout New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland. And we have a consist of approximately 300 employees. And our staff are experienced and have uh, expertise in these, these practice areas. And we found that these practice areas are quite valuable to municipalities in helping them to um, proceed with their projects. We primarily work for the, for the public sector 
And one of the practice areas that isn't listed on this slide is grant writing. And we pride ourselves in being able to uh, identify and prepare grants for our municipal clients so that they can proceed with water and wastewater infrastructure improvement projects or transportation improvement projects, um, environmental projects. And also we have a, um, a strong sustainable planning and design group uh, that consists of landscape architects and planners. And we're able to um, help them do community revitalization plans and also uh, park design. So with all these practice areas, they all come into play, most of them anyway, when we're evaluating um, large scale solar facilities. So what we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna discuss with you what constitutes a utility scale solar project. We're gonna talk about the amount of acreage that's generally impacted by these projects and what is their electrical generating capacity. And then we're gonna go through the seeker review process and we're gonna focus on what are some of the um, steps that should be taken and, and more particularly, what are some of the supplemental studies that we sh you should probably have the applicant perform on your behalf. And we're also gonna talk about the impacts to the prime farmland and agricultural soils. And then John's gonna to speak to you regarding the following. So one of, the, one of the things we'll talk about the initial stage is, are you set up for this? What is, what's the type of permit you're going to require? We'll get in a little bit deeper to that. Are you going to be in front of your planning board or your zoning board? And then on the next page, uh, which is uh, page six, um, I'll go a little more in depth about the, the actual legal considerations that you and your board are going to have to deal with throughout this process. And the first step is going to be to find out where do you stand uh, with having a solar law, a good solar law on your books. Does it need, do you have one? Does it need to be updated? Does it need to be drafted for the first time? And if that's the case and you don't have one or it needs to be updated and you don't feel like you're prepared, uh, do you want to consider a moratorium on solar projects in your town? A uh, moratorium is an available tool for you um, as a board, your town board or your village board, whatever, whatever legislative body you're working with, they're the ones that have the power to create a moratorium to sort of do this whole time out and allow you to uh, draft an appropriate law to deal with these, uh, with these applications that are gonna be, have been coming and they're gonna be coming. We'll also cover decommissioning bonds and security, which is an incredibly important aspect of uh, this type of a use that sometimes gets forgotten. Uh, another situation we'll discuss is uh, making sure that there are landowner authorizations in place uh, prior to and at the time of your review of those applications. Of applications. Um, Steve will get into through the seeker process a little bit of, of the board's responsibility to recognize and address what the impacts to neighboring properties might be for the larger uses that we're going to be dealing with here. And then near the end of the discussion, I'm going to cover uh, in some detail uh, pilot agreements, payment in lieu of tax agreements um, that you are entitled to request uh, if you follow the appropriate rules. So, okay, well, we have to cover this. Uh, we're all in this together right now. So COVID-19 is here and we're deep in it. And as we all know, as we all know, we are now faced with a number of unique challenges uh, specific to our municipal boards. And we're at a point now where we, we sort of have to move forward. Many towns and villages, counties are, we're sort of emerging from the darkness to start having our meetings again. I'm calling this a soft opening that we're in now. And, uh, and the boards, they have to move these projects along. I get, I get emails every day from uh, solar project developers asking if we can get them back on our agendas and start moving these things along. Uh, along. And uh, it might be a while before we have uh, 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 a return to what was the old way of doing things. Certainly public hearings are gonna be a challenge for us. Uh, but when this first happened, the governor uh, issued executive order 202 which was uh, a surprising thing that actually for the first time in, in my 30 years of doing this, they suspended certain parts of the open meetings law. And now we are allowed to actually hold meetings. This is town board, village board, planning board. We can now hold meetings by teleconference or by video conferencing, if that's what we wish to do. So long as that meeting is recorded, and, and then I want to under, underscore this, eventually transcribed. So there's a lot of talk about transcription of our meetings and there's some, opinions that it's an absolute requirement that the meetings be described word for word. It's clear it doesn't have to be by a stenographer, 
but it's also clear that nobody gave a rule on when those have to be done. And uh, maybe we get to the question and answer section and we can address some of that because it's still a little bit up in the air. Also currently unclear is exactly how um, public hearings are going to proceed. We've been doing them, it's tricky. And of course the key is to utilize some of these, um, these uh, real time uh, video and audio um, uh, uh, technologies that we're all using, that we're currently using right now. Um, and it's gonna be important that we have chat features built into these and that we have other ways of the board obtaining and creating a record through letters, email, other messages, uh, right up until the time of the vote, which is very important to keep in mind that you, you as a board have to receive all your comments, if it's in writing, right up to the time of the vote because it's gonna be in your record. Um, one suggestion that we're making is that perhaps as a board, if you have the time, you determine uh, to perhaps grant a little extra time after you hold the public hearing prior to voting so that the entire record can be received and then transmitted to all of your board members, a very important thing in the event that there's a legal challenge to any of your decisions on some of these large projects down the line. Uh, and with this slide, um, we've already talked about a little bit of that, we we'll probably skipped through. And now Steve will take you through uh, this next slide. So what is the definition of a utility scale solar project? Well, Many municipalities in the past five years or so have, have adopted um, solar laws and those solar laws will generally contain a definition of, of a small scale utility solar utility project and a large scale utility solar project. And a small scale uh, solar project is generally is considered one in which the solar panels are affixed to a roof or they're, as opposed to a utility scale solar project where the solar panels are, are ground mounted. And also a big distinguishing factor is that large scale utility solar facilities are meant for the purpose of um, providing energy into the grid. Okay, they're built for to provide a commercial profit to the solar developer. And so um, that's, that's the big difference. Now, a solar facility consists of several different components. Obviously, you have the, the solar panels themselves. And then you also have the supporting posts and frames. And in some cases, there might be an operation and maintenance building uh, constructed on site. You also have to have access drives. You have to have an access road not only to get the solar panels and the supporting posts and frames onto the project site, but then you need to maintain an access road after the facility is up and operating for the, so that routine maintenance can be performed on the solar panels or so also so that you can uh, perform landscape maintenance. More importantly, the access drive needs to be constructed such that it can accommodate a, a fire truck or another emergency vehicle in the case that there's a, there's a fire at the site. And then you have other, uh, you have other inverter equipment in your wires and cables and, and et cetera. Now, there's one type of utility scale solar project that we're not gonna be discussing today, and that's a solar facility that is a, capable of producing more than 25 megawatts of electricity. And these solar facilities are currently being sited throughout New York State. Perhaps you're aware of some of them. Um, BNL is actually representing some municipalities in the review of these um, very large scale utility solar projects. But they have to be reviewed and approved uh, in accordance with the provisions of Article 10 of the New York State Public Service Law. And one thing I would like to point out is that for these projects, the solar developer is required to put uh, money into an escrow account with the uh, Board of Electric Generation Siting in the Environment, and then that money it can be doled out to the impacted municipalities for their use in hiring engineering firms and or legal counsel if necessary in order to review these projects. Now there were some recent changes made to the Article 10 law, which John is going to discuss with you now. So out with the old and with the new, as we're as we're just finally settling in on how Article 10 was being being very was seen as frustrating to the governor and frustrating to applicants with these giant projects, uh, baked into the 2020 state budget and right in the center of the COVID crisis. So nobody's really paying too much attention to it. The governor has shifted gears and now he's created this new arm or entity of the Department of State and it's done under the auspices of the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act. 
A lot of words that simply means Article 10 is changing. And in some ways, uh, it's changing significantly. It's no longer going to be referred to necessarily as Article 10. Instead, what they've done is they've established this Office of Renewable Energy Siting, ORS. Uh, and that's, that's within the auspices of the Department of State, which is totally under the control of the governor. Uh, and the idea here is that the governor was tired of how long these projects were taking, the, the very, very uh, large ones. And now he's going to have more direct control over this. And it's going to provide for a more, <laughs> quote unquote, consolidated, consolidated state environmental review process for these large utility scale projects. Um, the upshot is uh, where 25 megawatts was what our trigger was for Article 10, uh, new applications where that are going to fall in the 20 uh, megawatt to 25 megawatt um, uh, size, those that limited group may actually choose to opt into this new um, siting process, this uh, accelerated siting process. Um, but remember, the projects that are already in Article 10, which is 25 megawatts or greater, uh, will, and if, as it moves forward, they can fall under the new streamline process. So um, the section, if anybody's interested, the section of the law, it's executive law, section 94C of the executive law, that's probably what people are going to refer to it as, as a 94C application, I suppose. We'll find out. Uh, again, 20 to 25 megawatts may opt in. These are, by, folks, these are gigantic, gigantic projects. Most of what you guys have seen in the past and, and probably will see in the future will be less than 20 megawatts, but these are the really big ones. Um, and we'll discuss that just quickly a little bit more. Um, so one of the things that's gonna happen is that ORS, this new body, it has to go out and promulgate rules and they got about a year to get it done. Until then, the very, very large uh, 25 megawatt projects are gonna still fall under Article 10 for now. but the way they're setting this up, they're trying to make it a lot faster and free up those delays that were frustrating the, the, the large producers and the governor. Um, so the first step is gonna be for ORS to set up a uniform set of permitting standards and conditions. Uh, and they're saying out loud that we're gonna go out, ORS is gonna go out and talk to NYSERDA, the DEC, uh, you know, the Department of Public Service, which is where the Article 10 was sitting. Um, Ag and Markets, which is an important um, agency with these projects, and then whatever relevant agencies they decide they need to speak to, uh, to determine what kind of regulations they're going to create. Now, uh, just like any other rulemaking, uh, they're going to hold, uh, the state's going to hold uh, public hearings on these new rules, and they're saying right now that there'll be uh, four public hearings along, around the state to uh, receive comments from uh, the public, towns, and, and anyone else that's interested to offer up their opinions on this. All right, so the next slide, show, this, is, this is a big slide. I'm not gonna spend too much time with it. Uh, again, I'll recommend anybody that's got more time on their hands to go back and look at this, but this is a nice little outline of how the procedure and the timeline will work under this new, uh, this new process. Um, the biggest change, generically speaking, is it's gonna, it's gonna lop off a lot of review time with this new body that's going to um, take over this job of dealing with the very, very large projects. In a nutshell, uh, you're going to, the, the, the applicant uh, will be entitled to receive a determination within 60 days if their application is complete. So a large uh, producer, developer is going to submit their application. They're going to hear back within 60 days and, and find out, is my application complete or is it not complete? And then, they will, if it is complete, they will publish their draft permitting conditions. These are the conditions that they've been working on for the last year, sort of generic conditions and some modified special conditions. They're gonna to have to publish those conditions and then there'll be a, com a public comment period um, uh, of 60 days. So we got a 60 day determination of completeness, completeness and a 60 day um, period to receive comments. And this includes uh, our towns and villages. Uh, they may also, uh, have the ability to respond to that draft of the proposal that ORS is going to create, and that would allow some back and forth with this. Uh, the next um, column on the same slide, um, it does state that the municipalities that have received the notice uh, shall, that's mandatory, they have to submit a statement to this body, ORS, 
to say out loud whether this proposed project is in compliance with their local laws. That's your zoning and other laws that you've adopted. That in, that in of itself might become uh, a procedural issue. And that last column on this slide, um, after that public hearing uh, period has closed, then ORS is gonna have to make a final determination within a year of the application being deemed complete. Uh, and within six months, if the project is cited uh, on an existing or abandoned local use. So there's, there's your key time period. This is why it's gonna get a lot faster. There's a year for them to make that decision or six months if it's on a you know, closed landfill or, or an old industrial site. Uh, now, if the, according to the regulations, if ORS fails to meet that deadline and get ready for this, uh, they will automatically, a permit will automatically issue and they'll attach a standard stock set of conditions for the project. So it's almost like a default on a subdivision that where you forget to vote on it, it becomes more or less a default approval, of course, and if we go to the next slide, of course, there could be litigation over that itself. So there's your judicial review process. I won't belabor this. There's a 90-day statute of limitations after ORS files a decision for an aggrieved party to file uh, in Article 78. And that's going to be directly at the appellate division, which is interesting because right now most cases uh, involving planning and zoning boards end up typically end up in front of the uh, in front of the, your local state supreme court, depending on the issues that are raised. Um, I will skip through that. Hopefully, you don't find yourself in any litigation. Um, there is a provision for the collection of fees uh, that under the current. Uh, language, an applicant must pay $1,000 per megawatt of fees to NYSERDA, and NYSERDA is going to take that pot of money and they'll allocate it, uh, which is right now deemed to be earmarked for, quote unquote, participation of municipalities and um, community interveners uh, with regard to public uh, comment periods and, and hearing procedures. So how that's going to play out uh, remains to be seen. There's some additional rules regarding how these fees are going to be established and how they're going to be dispersed. We're going to wait to see how that happens uh, uh, down the line. Next slide, if you would, Steve. Um, again, I won't get too deeply into this. So, so the standard of review is uh, is a so-called unreasonably burdensome standard. Um, but the, the upshot of this is is that standard is going to be in place, but uh, the question about whether your local laws have to be followed or not is really going to be a decision that ORS makes. They're going to say whether your local laws are unreasonably burdensome to them, to the, to the applicant, and they're going to make that decision. And, uh, and they get to balance that against the governor's uh, so-called Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is, is, uh, is very... Um, aggressive goals for green energy for the state of New York. So it gives you an idea that, this, that the governor wants this body, or is to be able to jump over the top of some of our, of our concerns at the local level and, and may divest us of uh, participation in the enforcement of our local laws through their administrative process. So that's just another thing I think that's going to irk towns and, and counties and villages in this process. And we'll skip through the next one to keep us on time. Okay, uh, additional uh, provisions in, uh, in this new law is, the, uh, is an incentive program and uh, what they're really trying to capitalize are the so-called build ready projects. Uh, and these are the abandoned commercial sites, the brownfields, the landfills, the industrial sites that are closed and the under, so-called underutilized sites. With these projects, they really wanna put those on an incredible uh, fast track for this. And I, the, the slide I use, I think this it shows Governor Cuomo and Al Gore shaking hands. And my only thought with that slide was Dr. Fauci would be shuddering to see the two of them shaking hands because they're not supposed to shake hands anymore. But I, either way, uh, uh, that's, that's the, the super uh, sonic quick way to get a project approved. All right, thanks, John. So now we're going to spend a few minutes um, going through the seeker review process for a utility scale solar project. And the steps I listed here are, are the steps that you would follow basically in reviewing any larger complex project. Um, and what I'd like to mention though is that um, a lot of municipalities have provisions in their in, either in their solar law or perhaps in their site plan review code whereby they can require the developer to to put money into an escrow account 
and that money can then be used to retain the services of an engineering firm uh, or legal counsel in order to assist the planning board in reviewing uh, these projects. And so um, that's how, you know, that's how Barton LaJudas has been able to assist these planning boards in reviewing these solar projects without the towns having to spend any of their, of their own funds. So is a solar project subject to secret? Well, it is. And the reason why it is, is because solar projects either usually have to obtain a building permit from the local municipality, or they probably have to obtain one or more state permits. And then are solar projects classified, they're generally classified as either an unlisted or more typically a type one action. And the reason why they're considered a type one action is due to the amount of acreage that they're going to impact. If they're going to impact more than, than 10 acres, then it's considered a type one action. And most of the solar facilities that are being cited in municipalities are anywhere from, generate anywhere from two and a half to five megawatts of electricity. And in almost every case, they need to occupy greater than, than 10 acres of, of land in order to uh, do that. However, even if a solar facility is gonna occupy less than 10 acres of land, and if it's located in an agricultural district, then it's gonna be considered a type one action as long as it's at least two and a half acres in size. And in almost every instance uh, that BNL has been involved with the solar project, it's, it's been cited in an agricultural district. Also, um, if the solar facility is less than 10 acres in size, but if it's gonna be uh, located adjacent to or partially within a, a publicly owned or operated parkland, recreation area, or designated open space, then it would be considered a, a type one action as well. Now, not that long ago, DC made some amendments to seeker regulations uh, for solar projects. And I've listed the six uh, is here. And so if a, if a solar facility is gonna be sited on a closed landfill and it's gonna occupy less than 25 acres, then it's not subject to seek review. And I personally, I think that that's a closed landfill are a great use for uh, the placement of solar panels. Similarly, if a brownfield site's been cleaned up and it's received its certificate of completion or an active hazardous waste site has been cleaned up, then solar panels can be placed on, on those sites without undergoing seek review. Also disturbed areas at publicly owned wastewater treatment facilities or at a currently disturbed area at a site zone for industrial use. And BNL has a, a manufacturing client that's located down near Oneana and they recently had demolished a warehouse structure. And instead of building a new structure on that, on that site, they decided to put solar panels in and, and that was not subject to seek review. And then lastly, the placement of solar panels on parking lots or parking garages, as long as it's less than 25 acres, is not subject to secret. So the first step is that the applicant is responsible for preparing part one of the environmental assessment form. And if it's a type one action, which it almost always is, then the applicant must complete part one of the long form EAF. Now the municipality is responsible for determining if the information presented on the part one is accurate and if the form is, is complete. So one of the first tasks that BNL does on behalf of our planning boards is to review the part one form. And oftentimes we'll find out that either the form hasn't been completely filled out or some of the answers presented on the form are not, uh, are not documented. So what I mean by that is that if a applicant indicates that there are wetlands on the project site, but that the wetlands aren't gonna be impacted or if they indicate that the project site is located within an archeologically sensitive area, but that the project is not gonna impact, uh, have an impact on that, we require the applicant to obtain documentation from the applicable uh, agency to substantiate the answer that they've, they've provided. Um, once part one's been deemed complete, and based on the assumption that the let's say if it's the, the planning board or the, the town board or the zoning board of appeals wants to serve as lead agency, then they are responsible for conducting a coordinated review. So that means that the municipality must identify involved and interested agencies that need to be notified of the project. 
And I've provided here the definitions for what's an involved agency versus an interested agency. And the one thing I'd like to point out that you may not be aware of, but if, uh, if NYSERDA would be considered an involved agency if it's providing financial incentives for the projects. And that in fact is the case for many of these uh, large scale solar facilities that are being cited. So here I've listed um, what some of the typical involved and interested agencies are. And some of these are gonna be quite obvious to you. The one I'd like to point out, however, is the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Um, all of, a majority of these solar facilities are being cited in agricultural districts. And they're also being cited on prime agricultural soils. And so the New York State Department of Ag and Markets has taken a keen interest in the review of these um, solar facilities. And you know, they're concerned because once the solar panels are, are constructed and in place, they're gonna be there for anywhere from 25 to 35 years. And that's taking away productive farmland in their, in their opinion. Now, unfortunately, many of these farmers are having a hard time uh, making a living uh, by farming, farming their fields. And so when the solar developers approach them and say, we're gonna give you X number of dollars per month as a lease to, to lease a certain portion of your property, well, that's, that becomes quite attractive to, to the farmers. One of the issues that we're running into though is that if a farmer is not farming the land himself, but if he's leasing it to another farmer, and then that, the property owner, the farmer decides to enter into a lease agreement with the, the solar facility, well, then he's basically taking away the opportunity of the farmer that's leasing the land to, to be able to continue to farm. So Ag and Markets is really, they're trying to, uh, they're trying to provide guidance to municipalities as well as solar developers and to how to best site these solar facilities. And for your information, there's um, a few guidance documents that, that are available to, uh, that you may be interested in obtaining. The other thing I'd point out is the, uh, down toward the bottom here is the Farmland Protection Board. Um, it's, it's important that if your county has a Farmland Protection Bureau, uh, that they be notified of the, of the project so that they can weigh in as well. So once part one has been completed uh, and, you've, and it's been distributed to all the involved and interest, interested agencies and you've waited the 30 day uh, period, then the, the, the municipality can, can deem themselves as, as lead agency. And then the next step would be to complete parts two and three of the long form EAF. Now, I'm sure as many of you are aware, part two of the long form EAF concludes subcategories of questions that enable the lead agency to, to evaluate, to determine if a potential impact is considered to be small or moderate to large. And you know, the evaluation of these impacts can be highly subjective and biased. And in particular, we're finding that with solar projects. So for solar projects, the, the primary concerns that we're finding with the planning, bar, planning boards is the number one concern is visual impacts. Okay, they're concerned, what are the visual impacts to the adjoining property owners? What are the visual impacts to sensitive receptors? So by that, I mean, if you have snowmobile trails or hiking trails, or you have scenic vista areas, and people are gonna be able to see the solar facilities from those viewpoints, that's a concern to them. The other concern is what are the impacts to the property values of the adjacent property owners? You know, or, or is that gonna have a, is that gonna impact negatively on the, the value of the adjacent property? Because those panels are gonna be there for, for 25 to 30 years. Um, the other is the impact to agricultural lands, which I've already mentioned. And then another impact is, is the impact of glare. Now the solar developers will tell you that the solar panels don't produce glare, but that hasn't necessarily been, been proven. And um, right now, Barton Judas is reviewing a, a solar project in the town of Minden, which is um, just off the New York State Thruway uh, near Canajahari. And um, we had the, uh, we notified the New York State Thruway Authority of this project and they ended up reviewing the glare analysis and based on their review, they, they had some concerns. And so right now we're having the solar developer come up with some mitigation measures um, to try to alleviate uh, 
the potential glare impacts. Now, when you're going through the seek review process, you, you, we've determined lots of times that the, the applicant needs to go out and collect some additional information. So with regards to visual impacts, what we will do is we'll require the solar developer to go out and, and take photos from um, sensitive reception locations. So, and then what we'll do is ask them to Photoshop into the photos what the solar panels will look like. And if there's gonna be an unobstructed view of the solar panels from any of these sensitive receptor locations, then we will ask the applicant to come up with a visual, visual mitigation plan. And a visual mitigation plan will generally will consist of either the construction of a earthen berm around the perimeter of the solar facility combined with landscaping, con combined with plantings. We also, if there's wetlands on the site, obviously they need to make sure that they're not gonna impact wetlands. Um, the other thing that we've found is that because a lot of these solar facilities are being sited in uh, open fields and farmlands, that they're impacting uh, the breeding areas for grassland birds. So we need to make sure that the solar panels are not going to have a negative impact on uh, grassland bird species, as well as other any other threatened endangered species. Also, if uh, you know it is an archaeologically sensitive area, then the applicant needs to go out and do a phase 1A and if necessary, a, a phase 1B archeological survey. And then the other thing that we'll do is if, if the solar developer, let's say he's gonna use 50 acres of a 100 acre parcel. If, if the solar facility is being sited on a, a large majority of prime agricultural soils, we'll ask him to possibly reconsider uh, moving the, the solar panel array or reconfiguring the solar panel array so that it doesn't have as much of an impact um, on the prime agricultural soils. So once you've, once you've gotten all the information that you've required from the, from the applicant, it's time for you, it's time for the planning board to create a legally defendable determination of significance. And in order to do that, the lead agency must take into account the entire project or action, right? The information that's presented in the environmental assessment form, as well as other information that the applicant has provided. Oftentimes the, the applicant will be undergoing the site plan review process simultaneously with seek review. So if you have information from, from that, that's, you need to take that into account. And then you want to apply the criteria, the secret criteria, and then lastly, you wanna make sure that you take into account any input that's been provided by the involved and interested agencies as well as the public, and, and, and that's important. Now, so then the lead agency must determine if the project will issued a negative declaration, if the project has no significant environmental impacts, or a positive declaration, in which case the project must proceed to the preparation of an environmental impact statement, or if, the project was considered an unlisted action, it's possible that the planning board could, could come up with a conditioned negative declaration in which they identify certain conditions that must be placed on the project in order to uh, negate the significant adverse environmental impacts. So once that's been determined, whether it's a negative declaration or a positive declaration, it must be filed with these entities I've listed here. And it's important to note that the negative declaration must be published in the environmental notice bulletin issued by the DEC. And if a conditioned negative declaration is issued by the lead agency, then the lead agency must publish a notice in the environmental notice bulletin and provide a minimum 30 day public comment period. So that concludes my portion on CICRA and now I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Okay, so. Uh, just to remind everybody, what Steve was just talking about are, are the size of solar projects where you folks as the local municipality have a significant say in the process. It's ultimately your decision. That's why you're the lead agency. That's why you're the ones that are going to grant either the site plan approval, the special use permit, whatever it is your solar law uh, uh, was put together to allow for. So this next slide, this is sort of the roadmap that we're going to take for the rest of the rest of this talk. And we're going to hit on each of these subjects. But just to give you an idea of why this is so important now, 
uh, I can tell you that the proliferation of applications for larger solar projects currently is unprecedented in my 30 years of doing what I do. And <clears throat> since uh, prior to 2017, I can tell you with all of those municipal clients and, and the entire areas that we represent, we didn't have a single large application. By this type of large, I'm talking about two, three, four, five or plus megawatt projects. But since that time, well, for instance, for instance, in 2019 alone, we had a dozen, our office handled a dozen applications uh, for these larger projects, five of them in one town. So this is the kind of proliferation that we've seen and, it, and it's carrying over into into 2020 and now with the changes in the law and the governor's initiative, you're gonna see more and more and more of these. So, so we will, uh, we will be going through these areas that, that are on this slide. And I do want to say one thing, and it's, I can't understate this. If you find yourself with an application for a larger project that you as a board are going to have to handle, I implore you right now to retain a very knowledgeable engineering firm to help you through this process. Lawyers are a dime a dozen. That's me. Um, although I do, I do think an experienced lawyer in this area is extremely helpful, especially when you get into the pilot agreement negotiations, the review of bonds uh, and decommissioning plans, et cetera. But I can't underscore the need to have uh, a solid um, engineering uh, firm in your corner. And we'll talk a little bit about how you get that paid for at their expense, which is ex incredibly important. And that can also cover your legal fees for any legal help you might need. So. And then next, you can skip right over that one, if you would, Steve. Okay, here we go. So what's, what's the big concern here? As you guys all know, Steve said, the best place for the solar companies to plunk down their, their large projects is on open farmland. That becomes a very, uh, uh, excuse the pun, fertile ground for these types of projects. And you can see why it's very, very important to New York State and to you folks as a community, many of our communities are farming communities, and you can see the economics on this slide that we've uh, presented. And we can talk about the billions of dollars, and we can talk about the jobs that uh, farmlands and farmers and uh, farming activities uh, generate. But the most important thing to, to recognize is that as you're trying to site a, 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 a proposed solar project in your town, you need to balance uh, that request with your existing farmland within your town. And it's gonna be important for you folks to take a look at uh, what impact these large project projects are gonna have on some of the prime farmlands that, that are located within your town. And you're gonna need some help. And we always recommend that at the outset, you consult with your local farmland protection board. You may make them part of that seeker process, perhaps as an interested agency. You want to get them involved early. You want to be, you want to have open discussions with your county planning board. Uh, you want to be on the, uh, you want to be on the lookout for soils of statewide significance that are found within the land areas that they're proposing to use. These are your food producing soils. These are going to be very, very important soils that, that are protected. Um, at some point, you're going to, larger projects, you're going to have to have the applicant or your engineer will give you some advice on the filing of a notice of intent with the uh, ag and markets and this could impact uh, the siting of the project when you get your uh, your uh, your feedback from ag and markets on the project um, next slide if you would uh, let's talk about the solar law uh, as i said before your first question is actually do we even have one there's a nice certa model that's quite good as a starting point you can find that on their website and you can use it free of charge and you can form a committee and modify it and, and get some help with uh, um, tailoring it to your needs. Uh, but what if you don't have one? We talked about the idea of potentially a moratorium. That is a very permissible way for you to address uh, a zoning law and set, set out that timeout and go ahead and form your committee while the moratorium is in place. In order to have a moratorium, you have to adopt a law that puts the moratorium in place. There's a whole bunch of rules with that. So you're town attorney will have to help you with a moratorium if that's if that's the direction you want to go in to get your your comprehensive solar law in place uh, another starting point for your solar law 
would be to take a look at your comprehensive plan and hopefully you do have one. Your comprehensive plan is gonna have a lot of clues in it as to what your town wants to do with renewable energy projects, where they ought to go, where they ought to go and more specifically, what types of protections should you have to your, uh, to your uh, very important farm lands. Um, now with regard to at the right, col right hand column at the beginning, that some of the issues that you're going to address in your in your uh, when your your zoning law or you redraft your zoning law is where are they going to go? What districts? What are the height of the units going to be? The individual panels. In my experience, they range from nine feet to twenty feet. Um, I've seen many nine foot projects uh, that have worked. We've seen probably the high end I've seen is twenty feet. That can be quite high. It depends on. Um, the area that they're gonna go. And again, your ordinance would address that. You're gonna talk about things in your ordinance about maintenance. Uh, Steve mentioned glare, that's a real issue. I literally was on a call yesterday where I was being told by the engineer in the project that glare was absolutely not an issue. And that's the engineer for the, for the, uh, the project sponsor. You'll talk about setbacks and you'll talk about, in a moment, we'll talk about decommissioning plans. And I do wanna mention, um, there's a recent case that just came out of, I believe it was a third department, if I'm not mistaken, that validates the power of a town uh, through the municipal home rule law uh, to adopt a comprehensive set of rules regarding the placement and regulation of uh, solar generating facilities. So, so uh, similar to what happened with hydrofracking a number of years ago, the courts have come out and said that your municipal home rule powers are quite extensive and you may in fact uh, utilize those to draft um, uh, you know, balanced laws for this. Hey John, that was in the town of Kasaki, just so you know. Thank you. Yes, that's right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, one of the other questions you're gonna have when you're drafting this law or whatever, if you do have a law, is which method are you gonna use for approval and review? Will it be a site plan method or will it be your special use permit method? Or occasionally, would you have both? I have one town that's adopted both the site plan review process and a belt and suspenders special use permit process. Um, remember with a site plan review, you're basically saying this is an allowed use in our ordinance. It's otherwise allowed subject to what our site plan regulations may say about, um, about uh, uh, solar facilities. So generally speaking, when you're doing a site plan, it's coming and you, you just have to decide how, how do we want it to get here? How do we want it to look? How do we want it to operate? What are the parameters of its operation going to be? How do we make it fit in nicely with a piece of land uh, that's been selected? But ultimately most site plan regulations, you're gonna approve so long as they've, they've uh, punched the ticket on the items you have in your law uh, itself. However, a special use permit process, it gives you a little more discretion and you're gonna have a little more regulation in there. There's gonna be some standards in your, in your special use permit law where possibly if the applicant hasn't done a great job, you might say no to it and tell them, no, we're not gonna allow that uh, under this instance in this circumstance. So that's basic difference with site plan and special use permits, which is really the same as it is for any other um, use that you might have in your ordinance. So um, next slide, key points to address in that local law. And again, you're gonna see these and many other laws that are out there. And I do recommend, I know anytime that we, we start in with a brand new use, we'll go ahead and survey other laws and take a look at what other folks are doing, try to pick out the good things and, and synthesize those into a very nice law that'll meet your needs. Um, so whether it's a site plan or a special use uh, law, a lot of the things you're gonna to try to address in your law are gonna be uh, the grading issues, uh, what's gonna happen to vegetation, what are you gonna require for plantings? What about exterior lighting? Um, the most important thing is gonna be the layout. How's it gonna lay out on this piece of land that they're proposing to use? Um, one of the things that our laws have when we design them and draft them up is there's a requirement that the contact information for the installer has to be on the site during and after the, uh, after the construction of, of the system so that there's ability to get a hold of the operator 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, what zoning district designation are you going to put down for these types of uses? Uh, one bone of contention and a back and forth negotiation might be the maintenance plan that you're going to require. And again, every one of these things is going to be outlined in your law so that you have a backup for requiring it. But a maintenance plan can be something that the applicant will want to 
uh, provide to you. Uh, oftentimes you may want to lay out in your law like the bare minimum of maintenance. How often is it going to be mowed? What's the clearing schedule going to be? What other types of maintenance will there be? If there's a panel that goes down and goes dark, are you going to require them to replace it right away? Lots of things to think about in the so-called maintenance plan aspect of an application. Uh, the next two items are basically stormwater management. This is where your engineer comes back into play for you. Um, very, very important. Stormwater management, very important with these types of uses. They take up a lot of space. And even though they sit on lands and soils that are typically well drained, you hope, um, there is an impact when during heavy rain events that Steve can talk to you about. So you have to make sure that you have measures in hand to address stormwater management for the project. Um, of course, at the very end of the left column, I say you want to get your, your engineer to sign off on, on all of those things. On that right-hand column, these are all the typical things you might see with any sort of a, uh, a specially permitted use or site plans, fencing and lot coverage and screening and all of these things that we talk about. Um, I do want to take one second to talk about um, but the law having in it, or if you have a standalone law, you really need to have a, uh, a provision or a standalone law for reimbursement of professional fees. And that should be baked right into your solar law or a separate standalone law in your ordinance. And what you're looking for, is, and it's allowed, it's, a, it's a definitely a, a tool you may adopt, uh, it's to cover uh, projected uh, engineering fees and projected legal fees so long as they are necessary and reasonable. And there's case law that supports the town's ability to require those things. Uh, next slide, if you would, Steve. Uh, final board review and approval or denial of, the, of a project. I won't belabor that. It's basically gonna be the same thing that you do for any of your approvals. Number one, you gotta have findings. You should have a written resolution that you're acting on at the time of approval of a large project like this. Just briefly, uh, before we, uh, you can keep that checklist up there, which is, you can leave it right there, Steve. That's a great checklist. We'll talk about it in a second. I do wanna talk about something that, that's really not in the, not in the um, this talk right now, but it's come up more and more lately, which is the unexpected impacts of these projects. What we began to learn after a few years of approving a couple of these things is that um, when the contractor gets out there, they go hard to get that project rolling. And, you, and if you don't have a road use law and you don't have a condition in your approval for a road bond, a road maintenance bond, or a road improvement bond, you really want to think seriously about adding that to any approval you have, and certainly thinking about adding a standalone road use maintenance law, because you'll be glad you did. I've had more than one municipality that's allowed uh, a project to go forward, only to find out that some of those local town roads that weren't necessarily built to say a county spec are getting destroyed by some of the equipment that goes over uh, these projects. And you'll hear the engineers say, well, these aren't really heavy, heavy vehicles, but you gotta remember there might be a heck of a lot of trips going back and forth on these. And if they're, if they're removing uh, material from the site, regrading and doing some soil disturbance, you may have some issues with uh, mud coming onto your road. Again, degradation. So quickly, this checklist uh, is a very handy dandy checklist that I would recommend any uh, planning or zoning board chair or, uh, or the secretary of the board keep with the file, it allows you to keep track of the project, especially if you have two or three or four going on at the same time. It's a nice handy dandy little checklist to tell you where you're at with this entire process. All right, now uh, onto, the, onto the money, uh, which is, and then now we've gotten to the point of where uh, we need a decommissioning plan as part of our review. And we don't wanna forget about the decommissioning plan because that is what's gonna protect us in the event certain things happen, i.e. the project has, has lived its useful life, it's sitting out there on that farmer's land, now what? If that company has gone, we're gonna to have to talk about what's gonna happen with that. But the decommissioning plan itself should be part of your, your, uh, your, re your, uh, your local law, your ordinance, and you should have a specific section on this. And what we need to look out for is what will the decommissioning process be? How is it gonna be funded? And how much is it gonna be funded? Who's gonna figure out how much it's gonna to take to remove this massive project on that farmer's land? Uh, because we're pretty sure the farmer's not gonna have the money to remove it. And if the company's long gone, we're gonna have an issue on that. And remember, these things are gonna be around for 20, 30, 40 years. So we need to have something in writing 
both in our ordinance and in our approval uh, resolution requiring that a decommissioning plan be reviewed and approved by with some input from the engineer from the attorney and certainly the board itself um, and you can decide which board is going to do that whether your town board is going to handle that or whether your planning or zoning board whoever's got the application will handle it this is an example of a decommissioning plan language that we had in here um, uh, but again what we want to what we want to make sure we're doing is creating scenarios where we know when a decommissioning event has to occur it might not be at the end of the 30-year lifespan of the system it might be at the beginning when they begin to build the system they get 20 percent into it and then somehow they fold up they fold up uh, economically if they fall apart now who's going to take care of it and we have to have in there built into there decommissioning events in the decommissioning plan which will trigger uh, a decom the taking of a decommissioning bond if we need it or a directive from the town telling the developer or the owner of the land um, hey you you've stopped working on this you've abandoned it you need to get this off this off this property you need to do it soon um, again the developer will be very helpful or the excuse me the engineer will be very helpful in that process uh, next slide if you would Steve so what are the key elements uh, we want to know about the cost uh, to remove all of the materials and that's going to be key in your plan is going to require that every single part of that system be removed from the site itself um, and you're going to need help with determining how much that's going to be in almost every instance the developers engineer will come to you first with a an estimate as to how much it's going to cost to uh, pull that that project off the site it's fine to read that and look at it and be happy with it, but you're, I, you're absolutely going to want your own engineer to look at it and give his own or her own estimate to confirm uh, that amount. You don't want to get lowballed on that and be stuck with uh, the inability to have that removed um, from the site. Um, again, you're going to say right in the language, you want everything removed. That includes the fencing, of course, the panels, the equipment, the concrete, if there's any concrete that's poured on the, on the site, um, the access roads. And with one exception, sometimes we've had a farmer say they'd like to leave the access road in, and that'll depend on what it is and how it impacts, um, how it impacts drainage on the site. We also often get the request uh, by the developer in their plan that they be allowed to leave in any equipment that's below three feet of depth on the site. Um, so again, you wanna have all of this decommissioning plan language baked right into your own local law, and then it'll make its way into a written plan that your, your lawyer and your engineer can help you review. The next uh, uh, discussion. Can uh, I just well, add one thing, John? Yeah. Sure, one thing I'd recommend too is do not allow the developer to include the salvage value in the decommission costs because they're gonna try to do that. And, and who knows what's gonna be considered salvageable at 25 or 30 years from now. So Perfect. I strongly recommend you do not allow salvage value to be incorporated into their calculation. Steve's point is a fantastic point. And, and literally yesterday, the same conversation I had with this other developer, that came up, Steve, and they said that and my reaction was what yours was, was we're not going to count that towards anything because they'll always have in the plan, the big flowery statement of how, oh, this project, the, the materials are recyclable. There's a market for them. My position is number one, I don't know that. And number two, if I'm stuck with it as a town because they've walked away and the farmer can't take care of it, I don't want my town in the business of trying to sell off that stuff. That's not something we should be doing whatsoever. So thank you for that, Steve. I appreciate that. So we can... Uh, talk about so also with the decommissioning a really important um, factor in this is you, you have to make sure the plan requires the restoration of the green cover and the installation and maintenance of the erosion control measures that were in place because we don't want the we don't want uh, the fields to fail and to have a mudslide happening out there you, you absolutely need to establish cover and it's got to be to the town and the town engineers satisfaction um, uh, another trigger for a ban that beyond the failure to just complete it, uh, or excuse me, the, at, besides uh, running its useful life would be what if, what if they fail to complete the project when the set time, we, we definitely, you know, we've been using 12 to 18 months, that should be enough time for them to do, to get the project done. If they need more time, they should come back to you and say, hey, the market's changed, I'm having a hard time getting my panels from this country we ordered from. Uh, all these things should be taken into consideration, but at a minimum, a condition of approval and placed into the decommissioning plan should be 
a requirement of when the project needs to be completed and its failure to be completed is a default under the plan and triggers the ability to take the bond to clean the pri the property up. Um, uh, well, every plan that we do would talk about the town having an easement to go in there and do it if they needed to do it. Um, uh, okay, decommissioning bonds and security, another incredibly important part of this process. Um, the first, for, we'll skip over that first bullet point. That's really about what the what the, the landowner should be looking for. They got to protect themselves. The town's responsibility is not to protect the landowner. I I have seen um, advice given to the landowner to make sure they protect themselves and the leases that they're signing. But I typically stay out of that as as the attorney for the town. Um, the really important piece of this thing is that um, the bonds, uh, the security that's in place. Um, uh, be large enough to cover the project um, decommissioning and also that you determine in your law what are you going to require for the type of security will it be will it be a removal bond which is most of what people get will it be a letter of credit which basically stands in the place of some secured cash or asset or will it be cash which is king uh, and I said I, I know of only one ordinance that requires cash I don't think they've ever gotten it for any project um, but it's very, very important um, that you have some form of bond or security in place and that the town hold that security and that it runs in the favor of the town. Um, and then again, this ties into how much should we be getting? And we talk about inflation factors. We talk about prevailing wage in the event the town has to come onto the site and deal with it. Uh, we also recommend your law have a provision for saying how do you adjust that amount of your of your um, your bond or your security uh, because the thing's going to last for 25 years? So maybe $300,000 today isn't going to take care of it down the line. So maybe you're either going to build in a uh, a factor for inflation, you might build in a factor for um, prevailing wage if the town has to take it over, or you're going to build in maybe just a flat out factor of uh, of say 150% of today's value. I don't know whatever the number is. And then the, another way to look at it and put in your laws is to say, we're gonna revisit this number every five years formally and put that in your law, put that in your resolution, approving the project. And then you send a notice to the developer saying you need to resubmit your security at this new amount because the new amount is what our engineer just certified is enough and under today's dollars to take care of, uh, of this project. Um, any any kind of a bond you get uh, or a letter of credit should be no contest, meaning they can't try to back out of it. Uh, should be non-revocable for the lifespan of the solar project, which I get a lot of pushback on. The only alternative to that is to have uh, a very long cancellation notice, a, a minimum of 90 days. You get a letter in the mail from, uh, from the surety saying, hey, yeah, we're canceling this letter of credit or we're canceling this bond. Now what are you going to do? That's that's a big problem because now you got to chase people down, try to get that money back in place, and if you can't, and the whole thing goes south on you, you got a big problem on your hands. So we do like to uh, try to get these uh, bonds to last for the length of the project and have some language in it that would cover you in the event that something attempts to be canceled. Um, then the other practical question I have for people is this: Who's watching these bonds? Who's going to keep an eye on it at the town hall? Because if they are if they're only a year long, which is quite often what they try to give you, they try to give you a bond or a letter of credit that's good for one year, and then you got to keep an eye on it because you want to know that it's going to get renewed well in advance. Because you get to a week away from that thing expiring, you got big problems, and you really don't want to stick that on your code officer who's, who's busy doing other things. So there's got to be some thought put into really requiring longer periods of bonds when you can. Uh, we talked about the cost of uh, decommissioning. We mentioned about the engineering estimates. It's very, very important that you do that. This is what I talked about a minute ago, doing a periodic reevaluation of that. Um, now, let's talk just a little bit about pilot agreements. So, this is a hot topic. Um, again, reminding everybody, we're back at we're back at the level of the uh, of the you know the five megawatt, the two megawatt, the eight megawatt. You know, the, some of these that are in your wheelhouse as as a board. Now, this is where your town board is going to get involved. So, under uh, the real property tax law, section 487, these projects are already deemed to be exempt from real property taxes. That's just that's the way it is. They're already exempt for a period of 15 years. But under that law, you can 
trigger as a town, you can trigger a request for a pilot agreement uh, and make that demand once the applicant, the developer sends you a letter saying, hey, we're bringing a project to you. Good news, you're gonna get a nice, huge, gigantic uh, solar project in your town. Aren't you lucky? And you're gonna write back and say, thank you very much. We will require a pilot. Please contact my attorney. And you guys can begin negotiating that. What are the, what are the rules of that pilot agreement gonna be? Well, they're gonna be, they're gonna be 15 years long because that's what the law says they can be, and you want you want to go 15 years. Um, you want to um, make sure that you're not trying to get more money than than uh, out of them than they would if they if they had to pay taxes. And believe me, they're going to know what they had to pay with taxes when they have to negotiate their pilot. So cannot exceed 15 years. The, generally, the town wants to have these. You can opt out of the um, you can opt out of the 487. Um, exemption and make it taxable if that's what you want. Um, but most places will ask for a pilot and the statute itself drives the process. But if you like, you can include language and we showed you a sample of what Greenport's code had. You can, you can include language about pilot agreements in your actual local law. And again, there's, this is another one that has a trap in it. Even under real property tax law, law section 47, um, there is this trigger to ask for the pilot has a fuse on it. So you need to know uh, that once that once that solar developer has sent you the letter saying they're coming with their project, you only have 60 days, six zero days to write back to them saying, okay, we want that pilot. If you fail, if you fail to ask for that pilot agreement within 60 days, technically you can be refused that pilot agreement and there's a case that just came out, I don't know, a month or so ago, maybe not even that long ago, that unfortunately upheld uh, a situation where a solar company said, we're not paying a pilot because the town, the county, I think it was a town in the county, they forgot to ask for the pilot agreement and we don't wanna pay it. And the court upheld the fact that no pilot was gonna be required for the, um, for the project. And that was a really bad outcome. So that's Greenport. So Greenport decided to basically incorporate uh, 487 of the real property tax law into its statute, which is fine. Um, how much are you gonna charge for your, your pilot agreement? What it's gonna be? The, gu the general guideline that people go to it, it's not, it's not set in stone, is the um, NYSERDA pilot rate estimator. Um, and, and as you can see, it's a factor, this is nice, sir, just crunched the numbers now. This one, I think this one's from 2017. I don't think it's been updated. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what the range will be for a pilot agreement um, that you can try to negotiate. And if you find, find your electrical provider and you go across the, the line, for instance, I'm in, I'm in Syracuse, New York, and uh, I'm National Grid. So the low end per megawatt for me, if, I, if uh, I'm the town here, is $1,700 per, um, per megawatt. And by the way, that's for all taxing jurisdictions to split, not just for the town. And then the high end uh, for National Grid is $5,100 per megawatt. So now you're into this negotiation with the uh, developer to determine in that range, if that's the range you're gonna use, um, what are we gonna get in this range? Of course, you want the highest end you can get. They're gonna claim that they can't make money on it. They're gonna walk away. But NYSERDA has already said that in these areas, this is what's sustainable for these projects. We've looked at it and they'll survive so long as there's not some other factor that, that maybe you or they don't know about. It generally falls in the one to 3% range. So that's the NYSERDA um, um, a chart you can take a look at. Here, and here's the other rub on these things. I just mentioned, this is the money that you're gonna be offered, almost always is offered to the town, the county and the school district. Um, so the, the, the big issue here is how much is the town going to get? I think I'm speaking mostly to town representatives here. How much is the town going to get? Well, the town wants, in my opinion, as a town attorney, the town would like an equal fair share of all this money. And the school is going to say, no way, Jose. Uh, the, every tax dollar that, that somebody puts under taxes, we end up grabbing 70 75% of that, because that's what the school bill ends up running out, and the town only gets maybe five, six, seven percent, and the county gets the balance. My position on that is when we're talking with the town and the county and the school, because that's the second negotiation that's going to go on with this pilot agreement, is folks, 
The town is hosting this project. The town is reviewing it. Our code officers are out there dealing with with this project. Our town board's the one that's getting screamed at by uh, the, the residents about how big this project is. Our position is we need to get an equal share of this pilot money. And we've had some success in doing that. We've, many, many times we get far more than, than what the town's uh, so-called uh, you know, tax share would be, whether it's a five, six, seven percent. Um, keeping in mind that, um, that, that it is a negotiation. Um, and I always like to say to the school uh, when we do these negotiations that as far as I can tell, nobody on that site, nobody from that solar site is gonna be using your school. This is all found money for the school district. And by the way, most of these are on um, ag properties, which are enjoying a pretty hefty exemption anyway. So in the end, the school will get a fair amount, even if they split it three ways with us and, and the county. And the county will get a fair amount, and the town needs to get a fair amount. So we do say, uh, don't give up with your pilot negotiation, either with the applicant or with the other taxing jurisdictions. And of course, your other option, your nuclear option, if you will, for, for all three jurisdictions if they want to, is to go ahead and opt out of the the uh, uh, the exemption 47 exemption, and just by, by opting out, you're basically saying, well, we're just going to tax it like anything else. It's going it's just going to be assessable improvement. That's all this is going to be. And uh, and for a town, you have to do it by local law. School can do it by resolution. Um, there's case law on this issue. You got to do it the right way. And when you do the opt out, you have to file it uh, with the um, with the um, um, uh, Department of Taxation and Finance, the opt-out, um, and you have to file it with NYSERDA as well. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, also, you just can't opt-out for just large projects. You do an opt-out, it's not going to be for that project, you're doing it for your whole town. So, you're sort of painting with a broad brush. You need to, you know, um, you know, totally understand that before you make that all-or-nothing uh, decision. So, um, but when you opt-out, you're only opting out for your town town-wide school and the county have to make their own decisions on it and then the other question we get is can you opt back in yes you can uh, you can opt back in if you need to um, it's been done before there's no actual case law on it so it's more of a practice that I've seen and you can go on to a website and see who's opted out who hasn't um, and there's reasons why you would and reasons why you wouldn't and that the case that I talked about um, earlier about the 60-day rule also ruled on the the failure to file with the Department of Tax and Finance and NYSERDA and the failure to file makes your opt-out ineffective. You need to know that it's an easy mistake to make. So when you're doing that opt-out law, make sure you put that rated. Um, and with that, uh, this is what we look like right here. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. Uh, appreciate that. Um, we've got a few minutes left here, not a lot. So uh, I'm going to read some of the questions and uh, hopefully we can get through some of these. And again, uh, so everybody understands, uh, we're not gonna get through all the questions in the time allotted. So we will be following up with an email and try to answer as many questions appropriately as we can. So question number one, what's the impact of Governor Cuomo's proposed new siting regulations? Do localities have much of a say anymore? Okay, so that's, that's one of the things that the very early part we began to talk about. And the answer is you're gonna have for what I see, you're going to have very little to say if ORS decides to trump your local laws. Uh, and again, we're, we're talking about the bigger project. So mm -hmm. I suspect towns aren't going to like this new law that the governor has rolled out because he just wants these things. He got sick and tired of waiting for the larger ones to get done. He adopted these easier laws, which is going to make it harder on the towns. Next question, what happens after the pilot expires? Okay, that's a good question. So remember, the, the under 47, the pilot is good for 15 years. The exemption is good for 15 years if you don't get a pilot. So once the pilot runs out, the, 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 the improvements, the solar facility goes back on the tax roll. Typically, um, if there's some life left in it, you're gonna, your assessor is going to go out there and figure out what, it's, what it should be taxed at. Often, well, we don't know yet because a lot of these projects are way too young to find out. I suspect if it's like windmills, that they're going to try to come back to the town and renegotiate a new pilot agreement, which is going to have its own rules. But you can't, you can't just do an additional pilot on the exact same infrastructure unless you're going to really jazz it up and make it new and add new stuff to it. So that'll be an interesting discussion 15 years down the line. 
and how can towns and villages protect important farmland and scenic vistas? So the, the way I, the, what I tell people with that one, there's two main ways. One is when you draft your solar law, go ahead and make that part of the criteria for a special use permit um, approval. Make that a criteria that has to be a finding in any approval so that it specifically calls out the idea of protecting those types of important resources. It, that also come up in Seeker, by the way. Um, the second way of addressing it is to put, to have a, have a section in your comprehensive plan that outlines what you want to have happen to those important resources. It's always good to have it in your comprehensive plan because if you get sued, that becomes, that becomes a very important uh, trump card in, in your hand that you can play in court. Can you recommend any New York State municipal laws for utility scale siting that balances siting and local environmental interests? Interest? Um, well, there's a lot. There's a lot. I don't, none specific. I mean, none, but the ones that we've worked on are pretty good. But um, I would say take a look at NYSERDA's um, um, law. I really think you need to tailor these laws to your own situation and look at your own makeup of your town and then figure out what does what does our town want to do how how important is it for us to host these projects and i'm sure it is very important for renewable energy this is not a bad thing it's just got to be done in a in the right way but i don't think there's a one size fits all law for any particular municipality thanks john next one <clears throat> we've been told that under article 23 local municipalities will have no oversight either through local laws governing alternate energy installations or through the site plan review. Will you be addressing this and will you address the comments regarding the state exercising eminent domain? Uh, for, the for the first part, if we look at, if we go ahead and look at what's happening now with, with Article 10 sort of phasing out in this, this new ORS board, I think that really is your answer. And my initial review of that is, it appears that the governor is gonna be taking a, away a lot of a say in the process that even in the old article 10 people felt like they didn't have a heck of a lot of say in it but it's going to make it a lot quicker to get to an approval and don't forget they have they have that they have the wild card that was drawn up in the law that says that ors can just say out loud ah we don't think that your local laws uh, outshine the need for the, re the governor's renewable energy um, um goals thanks uh some of the applicants documents are huge and multiple <laughs> feet thick Plus large engineering prints. How in COVID-19 can that be made available to the public before uh, votes? Oh, that boy, if I could answer that, that's tough. And then we're going to remember, <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have 30 municipalities that we help out. And some of them are, have no technology. And others are incredibly uh, um, um, jazzed up with technology. Even for those, very scary stuff, scanning things like that. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, my, my, my whole thing is do the best you can. Do the best you can, even if you have to, if you have to take a photograph on your phone of a big map and then upload it onto your website, even if it's tiny, you know, you got to, you can just got to do the best that you can do. That's my only advice on that. It is hard. I don't have a great answer for that. Okay. Does the Accelerator Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, Article 23, adopted as part of the New York State 2021 budget, allow for projects in the range from 10 megawatt to 25 megawatt to be subject to the new regulations? So what we talked about was uh, a 20 megawatt to 25 can opt into the new, um, the new upcoming new um, regulatory process and those that are 25 or more, the old article 10, that they can shift over in there once it's up and running. So that's, that's really all I know at this point. Okay, this, is a, this one's a good one. Can applicants work with multiple pieces of joint properties to attempt to have each squeeze under the large category? <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, if you're looking at it from a seeker standpoint, so you're saying well, can combine them or separate them? Well, so, go ahead, guys. So, John, I'll just um, so there there was an instance where there's an Article 10 solar project um, in the town of Athens, and the um, the applicant actually tried to say that he wasn't doing a you know, one one project that was greater than 25 megawatts that he was actually doing like three separate projects because what happens with the Article 10 projects is the the applicant has to go and, and identify numerous parcels. Um, just for everyone's information, these mm -hmm. Article 
and solar projects require anywhere from 800 to 1500 acres of land on which solar panels are placed. So as you can imagine, the applicant has to enter into lease agreements with multiple property owners. The, right. the, the, so the pieces of property are never contiguous. Okay. Um, so Steve, the other issue with that might be if, uh, under the seeker process, depending on where this all goes, would, would that be some form of segmentation if they break, if they have, if there's a big project and they're trying to like sell it as four small ones, I don't know if that's going to fly. Um, right. I, I think don't. you're right, John. Uh, moving on, can a 10 megawatt or smaller solar project be approved under the new accelerated process? 10 megawatt? 10, 10 megawatt or smaller. I don't, I, that's, that's what I've read so far. Right. We'll, we'll have to see, but I don't think so. Yeah, I'd say no. Is there still any purpose for the state required local siting committees? Can the large scale lithium ion battery thermal escalation explosions event result in a positive declaration? Uh, well, there's a lot going on in that question. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that in a short period of time. Here, let me try to, I'll try to look at that one offline. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one, please clarify that type one trigger uh, is physical disturbance, not the total amount of land the solar project occupies. The footprint of the solar farm typically involves little physical disturbance and therefore is not counted toward the acreage threshold calculation. Is that correct? So there, I guess in, in the way we've handled it is the area, so the solar facilities, almost all solar laws require that the solar facilities be have a fence around them. So the way we've interpreted it is that any the area within the fence, including the area that the, the access road occupies, would be the area that constitutes whether the, the, the acreage amount. The disturbance area is for more for determining whether you need a uh, stormwater pollution uh, prevent you know, SWIP. Um, and in that case, it's really just the disturbance of the of the post being driven into the ground. Um, yep. So, yeah, and keep in mind that that the environmental impacts themselves aren't limited in this instance simply to a piece of part of the soil being turned over. There's all kinds of impacts that a large project could have beyond just disturbance of the soil. Right. Right. Next question is prior is a prior tree farm property considered un, considered under ag and markets. Uh, this farm was in existence for more than 50 years, but the new owner has cut all the trees in preparation for the new solar farm. Oh. And it's not in an ag, ag district. Oh, I've not, I've not run into that question. Steve, any idea on that? No, I think I'd have to think about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'd have to think about that too. That's a good question. All right, we'll address that later. Uh, why can't there be a requirement to integrate solar with agriculture operations uh, in order to maximize the land's productivity? There are always ways to situate solar panels in a way that barely impacts agricultural productivity. And I think Ag and Markets is, uh, will give you guidance on that. I think there yeah. are ways. Yeah. That's a good question. That, that's, there, there that's, are, so if, if, the, if the person asking the question, if you were to Google Ag and Markets and, and solar, there are some um, guidance documents that are available uh, that would probably answer that question. Yeah, they have a very nice standard um, uh, publication that they'll send back with, after you, you send out the notice of intent when they get back to you, and they'll, they'll give you some really good things. They give you a lot to think about as a board member, and, and don't be, my, my advice is don't be afraid as a board when you get a third party like Ag and Marcus to say something about maybe the applicant having to make a project change, I would, if, if that's how you guys as a board feel, I would embrace that, point to that third party and say, we really need you to address this. We would like to see you incorporate some of these comments from, from these agencies. So these agencies are out there to give you advice and guidance and I think the board can rely on that and can try to uh, negotiate some of that into the project. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, next question, will projects that are now under Article 10 review be switched to the new streamlined review process or will they continue under Article 10? We, well, we think they're going to go over there because it's going to be easier. 
they can opt into that, correct? Yeah, that's that's how I read it, and I think that's what everybody's going to do. I guess it depends on how far down the line you are. If you're if you're very close to getting the process done, I guess um, you probably just hang out. Right. Uh, to what extent should the municipality consider impact on the adjoining homeowners' view shed? Uh, my town is dealing with a proposed project on farmland that has several adjoining landowners whose primary concern uh, is that the panels will block their view of the surrounding hills. They are unimpressed by the promise to plant <laughs> screening vegetation because uh, their view will still be blocked. I sympathize, but I don't know how to address <laughs> this. Well, that, that's one of those subjective areas, right? So the visual impacts. I mean, um, I certainly think that the planning board should take into account the the visual impacts to the adjoining property owners. Um, but they have to weigh that with, you know, so if there's a, a berm is placed around the, the perimeter of the solar facility and then you do have required plantings, and if there's provisions that those plantings have to be kept up and maintained, um, then I think then it comes down to, and John, you can tell me if you agree or not, but then it comes down to the planning board's decision as to whether the visual impacts are considered small or they're considered uh, moderate to large with the mitigation measures. Yeah, I, I agree with Steve on that. Yeah, so do I. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got time for another question or two. Um, let's, let me see, let's go over to actual questions and answers. Um, The pilot guidance issued by NYSERDA is unclear about whether or not a municipality is required to opt out of the 487 exemption in order to negotiate a pilot or whether pilots are an option for the municipality regardless of whether or not they opt out. Yeah, it's an, it's an option. You don't have to opt out of the exemption. You, you actually want, you're, you have the right to, once you find out somebody's bringing a solar project to your town, to send that letter, um, demanding the pilot then they have to negotiate it i've seen the opposite which is uh where a town will opt out to get leverage or school or whoever they try to get leverage over the applicant and it, it sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't oftentimes it's, it puts the town and the school and the county at each other's throats when one party has negotiated something and then the school at the last minute opts out and they're like oh that blew up the whole deal um so, you know, you're not required to do that. Oh, the, the, the only other thing I would say uh, as a piece of advice would be, I do a letter, a standard stock letter um, that I give to my clients that if that notice comes that we're bringing a solar project to your town, I have it already filled out the language that you need to have in it to demand the pilot, then all the supervisor or the assessor or whoever it is that gets the letter, they just sign the bottom of it and they send it back to them and you've met your 60 day requirement. You, you need to fill in like, yeah, address or whatever. But I think it's a good idea to have that letter handy. And then also to make sure periodic, per, periodically you remind the town supervisor, you remind the uh, assessor or the town clerk, be on the lookout for these innocuous looking letters from some solar company because inside that letter somewhere it might quietly say, hey, by the way, we're bringing a solar project to you. And that starts the 60 days and then you miss the 60 days and then it's, it's a holy mess after that. Okay, one or two more questions here. Um, is the prescribed appellate division appeal review in lieu of Article 78? So I, I believe, so under this rule, you're basically taking your appeal, which I believe is going to be in the form of an Article 78, to, directly to the appellate division, because the way this new law is working out, it looks like that's your venue you have to go to. And it's going to be by, and by way of a petition. Um, most likely it's going to be the Article 70, because you can do Article 78 in Supreme Court, you can do them at the appellate level. I believe this is going to be a direct action to the appellate division itself. Uh, another one, if a closed landfill is over 25 acres, would it be considered a secret type one or unlisted action? Also, can solar be placed on brownfield sites that have not received a COC? So mm -hmm. I can answer that. It, okay. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't matter how large the landfill is. What matters is the, um, the, how, much, how many acres of solar panels are going to occupy. So as long as the solar panels are occupying 25 acres or less, then in my, in my interpretation, it would be a, uh, an exempt activity from CICRA. And 
um, the brownfield site does have to have received its uh, certificate of completion because if it hasn't received its certificate of completion, that means the site hasn't been fully remediated. Okay. Um, so you wouldn't want to put solar panels on a site that hasn't been fully remediated. Okay. In the interest of time here, I guess we will uh, take uh, one more question or we'll answer one more question. And then uh, again, for everyone's edification, we will do our best to address all of these in a follow-up email. Uh, last question, IDAs would be considered as an involved agency, correct? Uh, if the IDA has to issue a physical permit, yes, but I don't think, I think they're gonna be an interested agency because they're just providing funding. Well, here's what I do. I make every, when I send out my notices, I send a letter, I, 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 get, I get sneaky, I send a letter out that says, you have been identified as an involved slash interested agency. And then, then I don't even have to get that far. <laughs> okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve and uh, Jean uh, and the Tug Hill Commission folks. Thank you very much uh, for being our host today. Hope this has been uh, worthwhile for everybody in attendance. I will say that at one point we had over 490 participants uh, in today's uh, webinar. So Sounds like it's a very interesting interest. Everybody's interested, very timely. Uh, yeah, well, with that, we had, an, we had a, a, a person say funding agency is actually an involved agency. I don't dispute that. I just didn't off the top of my head. Yep. Yeah. Got it. Thank okay. you. Thank you, to Andrew, on that. All right. So I guess with that, uh, that ends our session today. And uh, this, will, this uh, video will be available. Uh, we'll do a follow-up email with everybody on uh, answering some of these questions. And we hope you all enjoyed it and got something out of it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.